My name is Thomas Ferry, but you can call me by my first name, Thomas. Uh, and before I start, I'd like to share a little bit about myself. So I started with the X at Berkeley lab um, about six months ago as a researcher and developer. But I have been involved with the UC Berkeley entrepreneurship and innovation scene for about three years now. There, I helped teach the tech firm leadership course, uh, co-founded um, an organization called the Berkeley Leadership Network, and published a paper through IEEE on the applications of machine learning uh, to entrepreneurship research. But enough about me, uh, because we'll be here today until uh, 5.30, I believe. And that leaves us a short amount of time to cover a very vast topic. Uh, if you would like, afterwards, I posted some resources and the code I'll show you today at this address. Feel free to go, um, and I'll also try to send it to you by email if possible. OK, along with this workshop, uh, the X at Berkeley team and I give many other classes on AI, machine learning, and uh, blockchain topics. So feel free to reach out by email. I work with Alex that you saw this morning. Um, and yeah, email or LinkedIn if you're interested. OK, so right now, if you feel a little bit anxious, uh, not knowing what to expect, you're seeing a kid in front of you, you're like, huh, he's probably one of those like, very smart Silicon Valley geniuses. And then you're like, wait a minute, he's wearing a suit. That doesn't make sense. <laughs> so I understand. I, I know how you feel. I've been in those seats. Uh, and it's normal. It's normal to feel uh, a little nervous because you want to make sure you get something out of this. You want to make sure uh, this is valuable to you and you're not wasting your time. Well, my hope is that as this workshop progresses, uh, you won't be nervous anymore. Uh, after attending this workshop, you can expect to better understand what Ethereum is, uh, why it matters, and how it works. You can also look forward to uh, learning what smart contracts are, how they are applied today, and how they can potentially impact economies in our society. And finally, I'll show you the basic tools and frameworks to start you on your journey to building amazing smart contracts and decentralized applications. So let's get into it. Uh, should have shown that slide. So I don't, you probably saw him this morning, but Who's that? You. Yes, that's Vitalik, Vitalik Buterin. And at the age of 19, he published one of the uh, most, pe most famous pieces of what I like to call crypto literature with all those white papers, um, the Ethereum white paper. In these 10 or so pages, he presented to the world in late 2013 what was going to become the main platform for decentralized application development today. Just curious, how many of you have heard of Ethereum before coming here today? That's what I thought. Um, so that's good, and uh, we'll be in uh, normal grounds, uh, known grounds. But to better understand it, um, we need to first understand why he decided to create it. See, he, like, back in the day, Vitalik was a huge Bitcoin fan. Uh, around the age of 17, he learned about Bitcoin and decided to get his hands on some. So he found a guy uh, who had a blog on Bitcoin that would pay five Bitcoin for one article. So he wrote a few articles and earned 20 Bitcoins. And then he took 10 of them and spent them on a T-shirt. By today's market value, this is how much he paid his T-shirt. I hope it was a good T-shirt. So, okay. Let's go back to our story. So Buterin fell in love with crypto, and when the blog he was, uh, he was writing for shut down, he co-founded the Bitcoin magazine with a guy named Mihal Eliese in late 2011. As he dove deep, deeper in the crypto world, he quickly realized that there was more to Bitcoin than just a currency. The famous blockchain attracted his attention, and he understood that the potential this technology could have on the economy. But he also realized that this technology could not be um, used to its full potential. Indeed, back then, if you wanted to build a consensus protocol, 
uh, and leverage the power of a blockchain technology, you had two options. Either you create your own blockchain or you use bitcoins. So the problem with uh, building your own blockchain is that it's hard. It takes a lot of time, engineering resources, and it doesn't apply to smaller applications. And uh, Vitalik thought this is going to be like the internet. Most applications won't warrant their own blockchain. Like, let me put it in th these words. Imagine every time you had to build a smartphone app, you also had to build the store and the phone that goes with it. Not very practical, is it? But you could go get around this and use Bitcoin's blockchain. However, it also had several li serious limitations. First, the Bitcoin scripting language at the time sucked. Uh, for example, it not allowed for four loops, or any loops, that what's, uh, uh, for that matter. Think about it. You had to copy-paste if statements 200 times if you wanted a 200-time loop. Not very practical again. Second, um, the way the Bitcoin blockchain checked for the validity of transactions uh, did not allow for decisions to be made about contracts or conditions to be stipulated during their lifetime. This presented serious limitations, especially if you're looking at contracts like financial options. And finally, an application built on top of Bitcoin did not inherit uh, it's simple payment verification features. And every time you wanted to see if your transaction on your application and your blockchain was legit, you had to go all the way back to the beginning of Bitcoin's time, which again, very long and unpractical. So realizing this, Buterian became frustrated. There was this technology with enormous potential, yet no way to leverage it to its fullest. So a few months later, Ethereum was born an easy-to-use development framework that allowed small applications to leverage the power of a distributed economic environment and the power of blockchain security. So to paraphrase Buterin himself, Ethereum's a blockchain with a built-in Turing complete programming language allowing anyone to write smart contracts and decentralized applications where they can create their own arbitrary roles for ownership, transaction formats, and state transition functions. Now, that's a complicated sentence. So let's debunk it. First of all, as we saw, uh, Ethereum is a blockchain with a Turing complete programming language. Uh, what that means basically is that the language allows you to run any algorithm you can think of, no matter how complex, recursive, complicated, how long it is, uh, no matter how much storage or time you need to evaluate it. If it's computable, obviously, if it's computable, it will succeed. And that's a very important concept and a huge improvement from Bitcoin at the time. Now we can build any computa uh, computable applications we want on top of a blockchain. But how does Ethereum do that? To understand Ethereum uh, and how it allows application to leverage, uh, blockchain, we need to first understand how its blockchain works. Uh, so first, the Ethereum blockchain is both public and permissionless, like Bitcoins. Uh, I hope you saw, and this is familiar, and you saw this concept earlier today. And as Bitcoin, it also still uses proof of work. As Jillian mentioned, uh, I said still, because as of two weeks ago, uh, the Ethereum Improvement Proposal 1011 uh, was announced and submitted for review to the community. And in that proposal, the first steps towards switching to a proof of stake consensus protocol uh, were presented to that community. However, for the sake of time, we won't cover proof of stake exactly. Uh, I believe I included a link that you can go check out in that GitHub. So, like Bitcoin, it still uses proof of work in mining, but unlike Bitcoin, and you can see this there, um, you don't get rewarded the same amount. So in Bitcoin, you just get 12.5 Bitcoin per block you mine, and over time, this amount decreases until you don't get anything anymore. 
On the other hand, Ethereum doesn't decrease, and you get five Ether every time you mine a block, a small reward for uncle blocks, as well as gas. And so now maybe you're probably telling yourself, what the hell, what is this kid talking to me about uncles and gasoline? I came here to build decentralized applications. Well, uncle blocks and gas are important concepts uh, on the Ethereum blockchain that you need to understand in order to design your smart contracts. So let's look into them. You see, Ethereum's rate of block generation is much higher than Bitcoin's. For every six blocks mined on Bitcoin, 250 are mined on Ethereum's. This increased speed of block generation increases the amount of block clashes that happen. See, when two blocks are mined at almost the same time, they're said to be clashing, and only one can be added to the main chain. Even if all the transactions in it are valid. So when this happened in, in the Bitcoin's blockchain, the miner that doesn't get his block into the main chain doesn't get rewarded for all his hard or her hard work. However, on Ethereum, because it's such a higher pace of block generation, um, miners would have a much lower incentive if they didn't get reward any time a clash happened. So to tackle that, Ethereum created uncle blocks. They're blocks that are discarded uh, from block clashes, but they're still referenced um, in a few of the following blocks. Um, although the data in them is not used, uh, the miner still gets the reward for mining them. And so now we understand block, uh, uncle blocks. Let's look into gas. So to understand gas, let's assume you activate a smart contract. Simply put, uh, to refresh a little bit from this morning, uh, a smart contract is a little program that's stored on the Ethereum blockchain uh, that can be activated or run uh, by funding them with some Ether. Don't worry about the details just yet. We'll get back to it. Uh, but Imagine you activate one. By activating your smart contract, you ask all the miners in the network to each individually perform the calculations within your contract. This costs them time and energy, and gas is the uh, mechanism by which you pay them for the service. Also think about it. If you could run any contract for free on the Ethereum blockchain, nothing would stop you from spamming um, the, the network. So here's how we calculate that reward that you pay uh, the miners. The gas payment is equal to the gas amount times the gas price. The gas amount is determined by how complex the contract is. The more complex it is, the higher the gas amount. Now, while the gas amount is preset by your contract, your uh, gas price, you decide on. And because miners are paid out this fee, if you want your contract to be ran super fast, you better make that gas price super high. Um, okay, so now you check your gas amount, you're activating your contract, you set your gas price and you activate it. What happens next? So once your contract's activated, as mentioned before, uh, it's sent to all minor nodes in the network. They all run the logic using the Ethereum virtual machine uh, as part of their mining process and come to a conclusion of what the new state of the network is as a result of running that contract. To better understand this, let's look at an example. So imagine we have an Ethereum network with three nodes, one minor node, two regular nodes, and a contract, a smart contract at the bottom. The two regular nodes have 10 Ether, and both the contract and the miner have zero Ether in them. So a node can, uh, can send the contract some Ether and an instruction either win or lose. This contract will hold the Ether um, until another node sends it Ether and the opposite instruction. So in this case, lose. Uh, then I'll check the result of the Golden State Warriors game when it comes out, 
And if the warriors win, it allows win, the node that sent win, to withdraw the money that was in the contract. And if the warriors lose, but that's impossible, uh, <laughs> Uh, it allows the node that said lose to withdraw the money. So now node one here activates the contract by sending it five ether and the instruction win. Uh, it sets up a gas price so as to pay 0 0.01 ether uh, to run it. So the transaction is propagated through the network and the miner receives it. It runs the code in the smart contract and comes up with the following state. Uh, of the blockchain, let's call it state B. As you can see, state A was here, the initial state. The miner runs the contract and comes up with this new state. He's like, okay, in this new state, node one has 4.99 ether because it sent five ether to the basketball betting contract and also paid a 0.01 ether uh, gas payment to the miner. The miner also, as a reward, got five ether and his account is higher now. So. Now, node, uh, as we saw, the miner puts the state into a block and broadcasts it to the network, sends it to everyone. And then node one and node two run the contract logic again to verify that it's legit. And uh, once they saw that, yeah, this makes sense, uh, they accept the block and put it into their own copy of the blockchain. Now, node, node two finds the contract and decides to bet. So it enters five ether, says lose, uh, because they're fools, and sets the gas price again to 0 0.01 ether. Again, the uh, transaction is propagated through the network, and uh, the miner node comes up with this new state. Again, it broadcasts this new state to the network. Both nodes run the calculations, and uh, once they've done it they, and realize it's OK, they add it to their own block. Uh, their own blockchain. So separate the gas from the five uh, ether? So every time a miner mines right. a block, right. they get five ether as a base, as the, okay. yes, plus the gas for all the contracts they ran. Oh, so okay. Exactly. <laughs> so that's why you see uh, he ran two contracts with a gas payment of 0 0.01 ether, right. and he got twice. So uh, what is the reward and what is the actual transaction? Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. So, um, as we see, we have this state C. Everyone checks it. It's all awesome. The contract now has 10 Ether. Assuming nothing else happens, our tiny network will remain like this until the smart contract receives the result of the next Warriors game. Of course, the Warriors win, told you, and the contract says the winner uh, of the bet to be node 1. Node 1 can now run the contracts withdraw method, it's a function, a withdraw function, and the smart contract will send it all the ether that it holds. Uh, to run this method, node one activates it and sets the gas price again to 0 0.01. Again, transactions propagated through the network, the miner gets it, runs the code, comes up with state D, propagates it through the network, and since everyone checks it, says it's okay, they add it to their own blockchain. So now, in our little example here, you may have noticed that there's an incredible amount of redundancy for every bit of computation on the network. Namely, each other node verifies the result of each transaction. That means every node runs all the computation. This means, if you think about it, that holding ether is essentially storing the ability to perform computations on that network. I've been researching Ethereum and all the blockchain applications for a while now, and rarely if ever do people mention this. Once you get into the more technical side of things, it's obvious, this feature is obvious. And so you're probably asking yourselves now, wouldn't these be far less efficient than just running the computation on a central server? Well, yes, it would be. It would be much more efficient to do it that way. But we must keep in mind that Ethereum and blockchain in general wasn't developed to create the most efficient computer. Uh, no, the value of blockchain technology resides in its immutabil immutability and verif uh, verif verifiability. Thank you. Um, however, 
as we saw, running smart contracts is costly. Not only for you, as you set them up, and you spend money every time you run it, but also for the planet. With more computation comes the need for more electricity. And so it's crucial, and I'm going to say that again throughout the uh, workshop today, it's crucial that you're mindful when you write your smart contracts. And you need to be mindful of the computational burden you'll be adding to the network. But let's look at a little exercise as, to better understand the cost associated with running a smart contract. So we'll calculate the dollar price to run a function that I came up with. If you want to uh, check, you can go on that link. I will show you a spreadsheet with, in one column, the uh, upcodes. An upcode in the Ethereum virtual machine is a low-level operation. And you'll also be able to see, there's, there is a column, the gas amount that this upcode costs. So for example, if you see the add function um, costs three gas, while the multiple, uh, multi multiply function, multiply operation, costs five gas. So let's look at the function here. Let's assume node one and node two, as you can see all the way up there in the um, inputs, are lists with the format string, string, integer. The first, uh, first string in each node is forwards big. Uh, the second string is either lose for node one or win for node two. And the uh, integer is five for node one and four for node two. Uh, the warrior's result, in this case, unfortunately, is lose. Uh, I know it happens sometimes, Steph is uh, injured. The gas price uh, is about uh, the average that you find on the market. In this case, it's two to, two to the 10, two times 10 to the minus eight ether per gas. And let's assume $700 per ether. Um, so if we look at our spreadsheet, we find that when we go into this function, First we check, is node one equal to uh, the node two uh, second entry equal to win, et cetera, all the way down, which results, hopefully I'm right, <laughs> to uh, basically an equality an, uh, check, an end, and an equality check four times. And then once we get into that if, the last if, you get, uh, you store, uh, in memory, the winner, uh, the address of the winner, which is forwards big, as well as uh, one byte into the gains local function. And then you return it. And so if we calculate it, we saw that this tiny little function is worth 51 gas, which is about 0 0.0007 dollars. So if the game is canceled, mm -hmm. are both parties' money locked? Well, we'll get back into it, but it's a possibility. And that's why it's very important to be careful when designing smart contracts. Now, there are some contracts uh, that will take into, uh, this into account. But yeah, if it's poorly designed uh, and the people send it and then the game never happens and there's no way to withdraw the money after a certain period of time, yeah, the money's stuck in the contract forever. So it's... Contracts can be very dangerous. And that's the point I'm going to stress again and again. Uh, be very careful when you build your contracts. Or when you use one, uh, try to go into it and see how it actually works to make sure you don't um, lose your money. So in that case, uh, you have to take a look at the code? Or? Yes. Uh, and that's the specificity. Yeah. Ideally, you'd look at the code wow. um, to make sure that but that's another great thing is that they're transparent, and we'll get back into it, but they're transparent so you can look at the code. And if you're proficient enough, you can, you check whether what's gonna happen is actually gonna happen. It's not like a human, the, the code will do whatever the code is. Uh, but we'll get, back, we'll get back into it. So as you see, it's not that much. Uh, wow. So it's not that much. However, they're like, because we use super simple computation, like, Operations. Now imagine like uh, storing a, like assuming a word size of 64 bits, storing a 140 character tweet would cost about $5 on the Ethereum blockchain. 
So good thing that those are stored on a centralized server or uh, the current president would increase taxes. But you see the point. Computation on the Ethereum network is inefficient and expensive, and you need to be, uh, and you need to be mindful of how you write your logic, but also of what code you store on the blockchain and what you should store outside of the blockchain. Not everything should be on the blockchain, we'll get back to it later, but sometimes you need to make the decisions. Should this be on the external computer or on the network? So, however, again, we need to be careful not to compare apples to oranges. The increased costs and efficiencies are the price to pay to gain guarantees of open, censorship-resistant code execution, as well as publicly available and immutable data. And that brings me to another point. The difference between a centralized server solution and a decentralized one is crucial. Building a blockchain solution because, your block, because blockchain is trendy is risky if not plain stupid. You need to think your application and features through and only use blockchain if it has a clear value add. Okay, so now you know how to calculate the price of to pay or uh, to run a smart contract and you know how you need to be careful when you build them. Before we go into more detail, let's first take a look at Ethereum's philosophy. It's important that you understand uh, what values the Ethereum developers believed in when they built it to better suit your contracts to it. So the design behind Ethereum follows these principles. First, simplicity. The Ethereum protocol is meant to be as simple as possible and so, so should your contracts be actually. Uh, people will, will not want to use your contracts unless it's crystal clear how they work. If you, and you shouldn't be using a contract you don't understand. Any optimization which adds complexity to your contract should not be added unless it provides substantial value. Second one is universality. Ethereum doesn't have features. Instead, Ethereum provides a scripting language that you can use to build any smart contract you want and have it do anything your imagination can come up with. Next is modularity. The parts of the Ethereum protocol are designed to be as modular as possible. This way, anything you develop on Ethereum can also benefit the entire crypto world. Um, next, agility. Uh, the developers made it clear that the network's protocol is not set in stone and that if they find a better and faster or more scalable way to do it, they will. This is exciting because it means that it will adapt and become stronger as it grows. And finally, no discrimination or censorship. The Ethereum protocol will not attempt to restrict or prevent specific categories of usage or users. Uh, you can do really whatever you want. You can even run an infinite loop on the network if you have the funds to sustain it. As we saw, it costs money. But okay, good. So now we know the driving principles behind Ethereum, how it works to enable the creation and use of smart contracts. But we still haven't looked at what a smart contract is. So let us wait no more and welcome to the second module, smart contracts. Earlier, uh, we saw that a smart contract is a little computer program that's stored on the Ethereum blockchain. It can be activated or run by giving it some money. And once mined, these contracts change the state of the network in a predetermined way when some predetermined conditions are met. Essentially, it's a, if this happens, then do X, else do Y. Now you're probably asking yourselves, Okay, I get what smart contracts are, but how are they stored on the blockchain? I hope you do. If not, we'll still keep going. Well, uh, smart contracts are stored in accounts. In Ethereum, accounts are addresses uh, that correspond to a certain balance of Ether. There are two types of accounts. Uh, there are those that only correspond uh, to an Ether balance, but there are also those that additionally can store some code. Those are the smart contracts. As we saw previously, to run a smart contract, you activate it, and to activate it, you need to send it some ether in a transaction. But how can you actually use a 
contract in real life. One way to do so is through Mist. Mist is a powerful browser specially designed to help you interact with the blockchain and network in an easy and intuitive way. Basically, it provides the graphical interface to interact with the Ethereum blockchain when you previously needed to use a command line interface, making it kind of hard to um, access it. So here you can add an account. Uh, we'll just go briefly over the main features. You can add an account. Uh, once you added your account, you can go into contracts and watch one. You do that by entering its address, uh, the name, and um, something we will not get into. Uh, and after that, you see it, and you can interact on the right uh, with the select, like by using the methods. Smart contracts are cool and all, but why would you? Why should you use them, and not a classic piece of paper? Well, for a few reasons. First, smart contracts are automatic. You don't need to wait for the other party to do what they agreed to do in the contract. For example, with our betting earlier, uh, after the conditions described in the bet are met, the money is directly given to you. Uh, smart contracts can also store ether. This means that you can design them in such a way that a party can't default. In our betting scenario, you will not have a situation where in the bet, uh, like you win the bet, but your grandma suddenly disappears and never gives you the money. Or in the case more uh, uh, legal of a broker, they can take everyone's money and just go to Panama. That can't happen with smart contracts. Smart contracts are also transparent and no one controls them. This means you can see their logic, as we saw earlier. And if you like it, you use them. If you don't, you don't have to. You exactly know what will happen, given that you understand the code, uh, to your ether in advance, given that certain conditions are met. And you don't have a bank or a other third party that can arbitrarily decide what happens to it. If you have a broker and the broker is corrupt, he can just give the money to the person that loses anyway. And that brings me to my last point. Smart contracts can't be corrupted. If a third party is supposed to verify and enforce your paper contract, it means that it can get corrupted and turn against you. It might not be a big deal in America, but if you think about uh, emerging countries where the government is and has been corrupted for years, this is a big deal. However, it's not all pink and pretty, and there are limitations. As we saw, decentralization is expensive. The more computers that run the code, the safer the contract gets, but also the more resources it requires to run them. Users of a smart contract end up paying for these resources. And I know transparency is good, but it can also be bad. This means that everyone can see it. There's no privacy in contract logic, and it's not really well suited for confidential deals. There are ways around this, uh, and I invite you to do research on that. Um, and finally, while very flexible when designed, you can design any smart contract you want, once they're on the blockchain, it's there forever and it won't change. This can be an issue for rental agreements, for example. Uh, while wear and tear is acceptable, uh, if you break something in your house and you're renting it, you have to pay for to repair it. And how does code define these things? What if there's something new that comes up? You can't change the code anymore, and if you're in that contract, it's over. So as you can see, there's some limitations to today's smart contracts. However, and that's a, that's a point here, Ethereum is still in its infancy. It's five years old. So there are a lot of fantastic people working on it uh, to overcome these issues. Okay. Now we understand what smart contracts are, how they work, what's good about them, what's bad. But how is that going to change the economy? How is it going to impact the industry? Are you going to become obsolete and you lose your job? Let's see. Question? Yes. In this slide, so you say it's expensive, right? The very purpose of these contracts is to reduce the cost. So what expense are we talking about here? Uh, computational expenses. Okay, so that's still... It's still smaller than uh, paying a notary, for example. 
but it uh, the related bit to what, right? exactly so like related so. Well, I, I see three ways this expensive can. Uh, uh, first uh, is the money you have to pay every time you run a small function on it. You have to pay some money. Uh, if you run a lot of those functions and you're a computer running all of those functions, that can become costly fast. Uh, the second is that electricity-wise, uh, not Ethereum, but Bitcoin's uh, uh, mining cost like uh, uses as much electricity as Columbia. All the, the math that you showed, right? Mm -hmm. pointers, so that's exactly. So it's, that, so as for the user, that is it. Yeah. It's not a fixed fee, so that it scales. So that's exactly, yeah. So that, as terms of the user, yes. Mm -hmm. What I meant by expensive, it's resource intensive, I'd say. Okay. Sorry, I should have clarified. Um, so, as we saw, their smart contracts are automated, transparent, secure, and incorruptible ways of creating agreements between two entities. They can either be two people or two firms, or even two contracts. So what does this all mean for society? Before we look into that, we need to understand what decentralized applications are, and dApps. These famous dApps are simply applications that distribute the power of distributed technologies, that leverage the power of distributed. There's no third party that stores and controls the application, nor its user's data. So let's look at Twitter, for example. Today, everything from your account on Twitter to your tweets, to your information, your email, belongs to Twitter. They can sell it to advertise it. They can, um, uh, they can delete it. They can change it. And you can't do anything about it. In a decentralized Twitter, though, once your tweets are published on the blockchain, they can't be erased or altered, not even by the company that created the microblogging system. Maybe not something to give in the hands of a teenager, but it's totally resistant to censorship. No government can prevent people from expressing themselves. Let's look at another example that involves smart contracts. Today, when you want to make a sports bet, for example, you have to pay a broker a fee, and nothing stops him, like we said before, to take everyone's money and go to Panama. However, in the decentralized systems, all winners would split the loser's money equally. Of course, as we saw, everyone needs to pay a little fee, but it's generally way cheaper than brokerage fees. And if the contract is well-designed, which you should check, uh, you don't run into the risk of getting robbed. And as you can see, the concept of decentralized applications is powerful. But we can take it even further. Now, imagine a word where you pull out your phone, you open an app, and uh, you want to go to SFO. So you use the app to call a driver, and the driver comes in front of your house. Imagine that in this world, you can, once the driver arrives, you get in the car, the driver drives you, and once you arrive, your bank account is um, withdrawn the money and goes to the driver. Sounds familiar, right? But what if I told you that the organization, let's call it Bitcar, behind the service you just used, is fully automated and decentralized? It doesn't have a CEO, it doesn't have management, it doesn't even have a physical address. Welcome to the world of DAOs, also known as decentralized organizations. Every time you use, uh, so Bitcar is a DAO, as I said, and here's how it could work. I want to give you an example. Every time you use the Bitcar service, you activate a smart contract. The smart contract works as follows. For every mile of the shortest path between your start and end point, you put one silver card coin, uh, SCC, uh, into the Bitcar silver contract. When a driver activates the smart contract as well, and then comes pick you up, the Bitcar app on your phone tracks your relative distance to the driver's phone to make sure that you're in the car, and it also tracks the car's position. Once you arrive to the geolocalization, uh, geolocation, that's what happens. The driver gets 90% of the silver car coins that were uh, given into the contract, and 10% of those car coins, silver coins, go into a gold contract. So the gold contract then splits its silver car coin amongst all the members of the network proportionally to the amount of gold car coins, or GCCs, that they own. 
you can create and earn a certain amount of gold car coins and silver car coins every time you mine a block. So every time you mine, you get one GCC, for example, and some SCC that's not pictured. But so what you can see here, as a result, the miners essentially not only get silver car coins, but also get profit shares from the application. And because the shares are proportional to the, amount of, to the total amount of gold coins they own relative to the network, they need to keep mining in order to keep their percentage. So that's great because imagine, now you have stakeholders that have actually to work for your company and they can't just sit there and tell the CEO what to do. So how does this translate back to dollars? Um, well, you use, when you use the service, you need silver, dollar coins, uh, silver car coins. So you can buy them from the miners, and then the miners get dollars, or you can buy them directly from drivers, which drivers get compensated that way as well. Bitcar, you don't need a CEO. You don't need to please state shareholders. But now you might be thinking, wow, this is cool. What about the engineers that built that Bitcar? How are they compensated? That, my friends, is when ICOs come in. See, once the engineers have built the system and set up the DAP, they can pre-mine a certain amount of gold card coins and silver card coins. If they want, they can pre-mine a billion gold coins. However, uh, they need to be, if there's more of them, uh, there's less scarcity and they're worth less. So to do that, they can create, a, for example, a time-bound smart, smart contract uh, that gives each created account some silver and gold car coins. And they don't public, publicly release the application until the end of the time-bound smart contract. So they create their accounts, they get the coins, and then they release uh, once the contract is over. This way they can sell the silver car coins to users and the gold car coins to investors and be rewarded for their hard work. This sale is what people call an ICO, an initial coin offering. Essentially, the creators of the network sell the coins of their blockchain to people that will either want to use the service or sell these coins later, hoping they increase in value. Uh, there's a neat way to do it in Ethereum called the ERC20 standard. This standard um, is basically a way for you to follow nice procedures to make sure your token is solid. You can do it on your own if you want. You don't have to follow that and write your own code. Uh, but the ERC20 uh, standard has been proven, and you should probably follow it. So what does this mean for our economy? First, notaries will disappear. Indeed, if blockchains are immutable, permanent, and time-stamped distributed ledgers, basically, then you don't need a third party to guarantee uh, your documents, your transactions, your contracts, it'll all become automatic. And you'll need a new kind of lawyer. Uh, as we saw, you need a lawyer that understands smart contracts. Is the contract, is the contract going to screw you? So the lawyers of the future will need to be capable of understanding, designing, and deploying robust smart contracts. Paper contracts might not fully disappear, I don't think so, but more and more, you'll see a complementary smart contract that will be referenced in the paper one. Um, also, anyone will be able to invest and contribute to the global economy. That is, obviously, if they have an internet connection. But if they do, they'll be able to help run and grow DAOs and get a share of the value created. And finally, supply chains will be automated, or at least partially. Think about it. The amount of paperwork, phone calls, and emails that goes into dealing with the supply chain is astronomical. My senior project when graduating was actually on optimizing uh, the ways they uh, treat information, and it's, was, it was Windows 98. Blockchain can automate all that, can also help accounting um, and making sure that you keep track of all transactions. 
But we could spend all day talking about potential applications, but instead let's look at how it's being applied today. So I wanted to share a few startups that are building dApps uh, that leverage the power of decentralized ledgers. Uh, I'll go quickly over them uh, because I'd like to show you some code actually, uh, and we're running a little uh, out of time. So first there's Grid Plus. Uh, this startup aims to reduce the cost of electricity by developing an automated smart grid. Users could buy electricity using tokens, but also sell those tokens if they don't use it, essentially selling electricity back to the grid. Um, for more information, I invite you to read the, their white paper. Then there's Uport. Um, think of signing with Facebook or signing with Google for dApps. And it essentially provides developers with a universal and identification system uh, to authenticate users in an easier way uh, than through anonymous addresses. And finally, uh, Go Bears. Sapien aims to, Sapien is a Berkeley spin-off, aimed to solve two problems in current social media. Uh, first, they have, like current social media, have no effective way of identifying fake news. And second, they don't reward users that create value. So Sapien plans on solving those by creating a decentralized social network. Um, again, all those have white papers. Uh, if you're interested, go read. And so as you can see, the range of applications of the tech is very large, and you're only bound by your imagination. Now it's cool and all to see how the technology is applied, but it's even better to apply it ourselves. Yes? Oh, Sapien, S, I'll write it down. Uh, so before we look at code um, and the details of, the, of Solidity, one of Ethereum's programming languages, we need to understand some um, basic principles governing smart contracts. In Solidity, smart contracts are very similar to classes in JavaScript. So each time a contract is activated, a new instance is created. As a result, you need a constructor function. Typically, uh, this constructing function, depending on the versions, is either named constructor or is, has the same name than your contract. Um, and also, in this function, you store the address of the person that activated it. In order for users to interact with the contract, you need to write callable functions that you make public. For example, here, a withdraw function. And it's also important that you record what happens during the execution of the contract, especially for debugging purposes. And to do so, you create events, which are essentially logs of what happens in your contract. As I said, they're very useful for debugging because there's no uh, console log or print F uh, in Solidity. And okay, now we have the basic principles behind smart contract design. It's as simple as that. So let's look into some code. Um, in Ethereum, we have several different programming languages, all offering different features and capabilities. And the main ones are Serpent, that is inspired by Python, LLL, a lower level language inspired by Lisp, and Solidity, similar to C and JavaScript. Today we'll look at Solidity code, but I invite you to do some research on the other ones and choose the one that fits you best. So what I'll be using is this website. Remix is a great IDE to quickly compile and test your smart contracts. However, this can quickly get uh, limiting, as it's just a browser IDE and you want something more professional and enterprise grade. So let's look at the Solidity and Ethereum environments to better understand how uh, all the different tools of better development work together. In the end, smart contract development, like any other, boils down to the following steps. Design and code, test, and deploy. The difference here is that because they're immutable and once you deploy them, you can't go back to code and redesign. We'll get back into that, but it's an important thing to keep in mind. 
So we're, in this module, we'll look at uh, the tools that you can use for all those steps of development and how they fit together. And we'll end briefly talking about security. So let's look at design. As with the majority of languages, you can write code in any text editor and then put it in a compiler. In order to make it easier on your eyes and your brain, you can download some syntax highlighting uh, plugins for most text editors. My favorite one is Sublime. As we saw earlier with Remix, there are also some great IDEs on your browser that have a lot of cool features. But they get limiting fast, and you want something more powerful. And that's pretty much all there is to it. So let's look at how to test them now. One of the most prominent tools to test your smart contract is, uh, with is Truffle. Truffle will not only help you compile your contracts, but also will help you test and deploy them. I won't get into the details of how to install it and set it up, but I put great tutorials into that GitHub. Um, so go there if you're interested. In Truffle, you can create a project folder in which you store your different um, contracts, as well as migration scripts, will help, which will help you deploy them to a real blockchain. Once you created your project and have your .sol solidity file in the contract, with the contract in it, you can start testing it in two ways. Either use a tool developed by Truffle called Ganache, or um, use a more advanced tool called Geth. We'll get back to Geth. Let's first look at Ganache. Uh, it's a tool that creates a virtual Ethereum blockchain on your computer, and it generates some fake accounts that we can use to test the functionalities of our contract. It offers a, both a command line interface as well as a more user-friendly GUI. The GUI looks like this and is very intuitive. Um, and it's pretty much all the same. They typically create you five to 10. You can set that number of fake accounts with fake ether in it. And so while this is great to test our contracts fast, um, it's not well suited to help you deploy them. Uh, be it on a private local network, the, uh, oh, sorry, to deploy them on the official Ethereum networks. On the other hand, you have Geth, Go Ethereum. It's the core application on computer that will connect you to a blockchain, be it on a private local network, or the Ethereum test uh, net, or Ethereum's main network, the real uh, playground. So for testing on private networks, Geth is more involved and requires you to provide a Genesis file like we saw with Jillian before um, that will, it will use to create a new blockchain. Because if you run it without specifi specifying this um, file, it will just connect to the main Ethereum network. Once you have your private blockchain set up with Geth, you need to migrate your contract onto it using the Truffle console. And once that's done, however, you can fire up Mist, as we saw before, and test your contract in an environment that will be very close to the one your users will have. So now let's look into deployment. Now that you've designed and tested your web, uh, network, you're ready to deploy it on the Ethereum's real main net. To do so, we'll use Geth uh, to download the whole Ethereum blockchain. But that's not easy task, as you, can, you know. Uh, it's very big, uh, in dozens of gigabytes, if not hundreds. Uh, there exist some ways around that, but not all of them are the safest nor proven, so use caution uh, when you do this. So once you've downloaded it and connected it uh, to the network, following th the procedure is pretty much the same as deploying it on a private network. But since it's a real world, you'll need real F ether to do so. And uh, deploying a contract on the main net costs uh, 32,000 gas uh, as a baseline plus 200 gas uh, per byte of code. So the average gas price on the market today, this corresponds to about 10 cents, $10 cents for an empty contract, um, which again, is not much, but still to be taken into account. And uh, let's look at a quick overview of the, the what we talked about, you can design uh, your contract with either an IDE or Truffle. 
uh, in your favorite text editor and compile it. You can also test it with the IDE uh, with simple and quick uh, compiling and quick testing, but then you'll need to go back to Truffle if you want to get more involved. Truffle then, uh, you can use Ganache to quickly again test uh, and set up a local virtual blockchain, or you can directly use Geth, set up your local blockchain, or connect to testnet or the mainnet. Then you can use Mist to test back your code uh, as it has a realistic GUI interface. And okay, before I leave you to conquer the world of decentralized applications, uh, I must talk about, again, security. And I can't stress this point enough. Once you broadcast a smart contract onto the Ethereum blockchain, it's there forever. It will run the exact same address in the exact same code as long as Ethereum exists. And the code will never change. And this goes completely against what at least, at least what I learned uh, entrepreneurship is. You can't here just build a quick MVP, launch it, and fix the bugs as they arise. No, no, no. Here, if you build a very weak smart contract that just depletes your Ethereum account every time someone uses it because of a flaw in your code, you can't reverse it, and you can't take it down. You might lose a lot of money because of, code, uh, of a bug in your code. So that's why you need to think your code through very carefully. Or the people that are writing the code for you need to think it a lot through. Or the contracts you see, you need to look through the code. Security and smart contract development is crucial. To help you with it, here are a few tips. First, as was said, think through the logic. Oftentimes, high-level problems are the most deadly. Second, keep your code as simple as possible. It's much easier to find issues when your code is easy to understand. Then test, test, and retest again. You've never tested enough, and try to find innovative ways of testing and finding your, issue, your bugs. Also study and know the limitations of the platform. Ethereum's fairly recent and still under heavy development. It has bugs itself. And finally, follow um, these couple development patterns. As we saw earlier, use a withdrawal pattern to transfer funds out of a contract. This way an attacker can only make their own withdrawal fail and not everyone else's. But also try to restrict your con your, the access to your contract as much as possible. Although technically everyone can read, yes? You said that you know, uh, a solidity contract, yeah. contract cannot be changed. Mm -hmm. Can you version it? No. You can send it, well, you can either have a time machine that the contract will follow, and at this time I will change myself, but that's also predetermined, and what it's going to change to. You can set a kill function that after a certain time your contract dies and can be used by anyone, but again, you need to think that of before you deploy it. You can deploy another version of your contract, but that will be another one on the blockchain that will remain on the blockchain. As of today, you can't version your contracts unless you have already thought of those versions before and included it into them. So if the contract does go away, it holds an issue that has gone away, right? Well, when you kill your contract, it doesn't mean it disappears. It's still there, but nobody can access it. So imagine a safe that has ether in it that nobody can open. It can have a million dollars in cash in it, but you can't open it. The cash is still there. So that's also another thing that's really important is in your kill function, maybe you need to think of how do you send back the funds of everyone that put it into it. Contract on the accounts. That's a public key account. Where, where is the security file between the transparency and the account information? Key account. Oh, uh, so you mean the address of the account? Uh, so the address of the account is just like your home address. It means they, can, they know where to send the funds, but it doesn't mean they have to key to enter the house. So the, the address can be, can be public of who uses it, your contract. However, um, it doesn't mean they can use that to steal your Ethereum, your Ether, sorry. 
But that's, that's also an issue because if, you're, if this means that you know who uses the contract and that makes some very, uh, how to call it, um, sensitive deals or sensitive contracts that are secret are not well suited for this type of platform. Wonderful. Well, I'd like to leave you with a few words. We talked about security, how the smart contracts can be dangerous and we need to be careful about them. But I want to leave you on a positive note. Um, yes, the blockchain technology and Ethereum in general are not well suited for everything. It's like a tool. If you have a screw, you don't want to be hammering it in. You need to be using blockchain when it's applicable when it will clearly add value to what you're doing. And in certain cases, it does. When it comes to the banking system, there are millions in the world that are unbanked. With blockchain technology, we could solve that problem. Healthcare industry, your records could be kept on a blockchain. And let's say you have a, a condition and you're allergic to some medication and you get into a car accident, maybe they'll give you penicillin and you'll get a fatal allergic reaction when you could have been uh, saved pretty easily. Uh, because you were unconscious, you weren't able to transfer that information. So imagine if you had, on top of your finger, access to your medical records and the EMT could come with a, a device and scan your finger and see, oh, let's not give this person penicillin. Supply chain could be automated. Blockchain is very, very powerful, and we don't know yet where it's going to go. The same way we didn't know where in the internet would go. The internet is essentially just a protocol to communicate between multiple computers. Who would have thought we'd have Uber, Amazon, and Facebook today? So blockchain is only limited to what you will make of it. And I personally hope that you will make great things. Thank you very much. It's been an honor to uh, speak to you today. Feel free to connect with me by email or LinkedIn.